Hey, it's back again. Okay, I'll be in Las Vegas as well, by the way. So um, I hope you'll come there. It is a, it's a great mixture, a much better mixture maybe even than today of, of material presented by Amazonians and by folks from AWS, as well as many more from our, from our customers. And I want to emphasize something that uh, Ed said earlier. If you, if you are interested in, uh, in presenting some of your experiences um, at, at the user conference, feel, uh, please uh, feel free to submit an, uh, a proposal for, for that. We're really interested in, uh, in hearing about that. Um, I also, I'm very keenly aware that I am between you and beer. <laughs> or better not, I'm, I am between me and beer. Um, so that might really speed things up a little bit at this moment. Yeah? So there's, um, I think big data is one of those terms that is probably even more vague than that cloud has become. I think um, cloud at this moment, especially if you think about the Amazon cloud, it is pretty realistic. Yeah, what you can build with it is uh, both from a technology side as well, from a business side, is pretty clear. Big data, mm, it comes kind of on the on the on the sort of on the back of cloud, but there's many different uh, def definitions of it. And so what I would try to do this afternoon is give you a bit of my view of this. You know, on one hand, there is the sort of high performance compute side of, of big data, and there's the business side, all of this kind of thing. So I hope that if you, uh, uh, that after this presentation, I've given you a bit better insight in at least in what I think big data means. And especially because I'm an engineer, what big data means from an infrastructure perspective, that it is actually much more than just analytics. So to start off with, um, given that you know, we are at some level still a bookshop, I would like to uh, introduce you to a book called The Fourth Paradigm. Um, this book is actually only 99 cents for your Kindle. Uh, you do not need to have a physical Kindle. You can read it on your phone, you can read it on your iPad, on your, on your, uh, on your Android device or on the web. Um, so you can actually get this, uh, this book for just 99 cents. The fourth paradigm is a, uh, is a term coined by Jim Gray, the famous researcher, who uh, really defined sort of the next stage of research. And that next stage of research where the third paradigm was really computational modeling, yeah, kind of trying to figure out how the world looked like through models, to a world where you no longer use models, but where you use data, and where your decisions are driven by data, and where it's all about data and, and, and analytics. Um, this is the sort of the short URL that you can use if you're interested in, in buying the book. The book is a set of uh, essays, uh, given that Jim Gray at one moment was lost at sea, and they, uh, his colleagues put this book together for him with essays about how the fourth paradigm is impacting all sorts of different areas of science. So, you know, while this word big data is actually getting, of course, lots of press because it's an easy thing to think about, big, big data, um, in reality, I like these two words much better. Yeah, we are talking here about data intensive computing or data intensive business or data centric business. If you look at, um, so there's a famous letter to the shareholders that Jeff Bezos at one moment wrote. He, he wrote it in 1997. And there's a number of points in that letter that really define what Amazon is. And, and the first one, of course, is a very famous point that is about that Amazon is all about the long term. It's all about doing the right thing for the customer. And that if you're interested in short term optics, maybe Amazon is not a stock that you should be investing in. But the second point on it is a very important point. The second point is that we will use data analytics in all of our business processes that we will, if we can measure, we will measure. And we will measure relentlessly. And we'll use that, those measurements as learnings for our business. And that is really a core principle within Amazon. So Amazon, in essence, is a data-centric company. And we have all sorts of algorithms around it, all sorts of, of an an analytics around it for the business itself. But you as customers of Amazon.com have been, from the beginning, almost exposed to what we do in sort of data-centric uh, computing, namely, for example, uh, recommendations is definitely something that's complete data driven, and we're getting back to that. 
So my favorite definition and that I sort of put together myself is, um, is sort of the engineering definition. Uh, so where you have to collect so much data that your data sets are becoming so large that you have to start innovating in how to collect it, how to store it, how to organize it, how to analyze it, and how to share it. Uh, and, but there's sort of a definition that was a bit earlier. There was a, um, a group of researchers from IBM in the early 2000s that already saw a shift in the way that business intelligence was happening. And they coined something called the three Vs, where there were changes in terms of volume, in terms of velocity, and in terms of variety of data. Where in the past, business intelligence had all been about that you already on forehand knew what kind of questions you wanted to ask. And that drove the data model that you were using, and that again drove the way that you were collecting your data. But big data is actually the inverse of that. You are collecting as much data as that you can at much higher volumes. Yeah. And, and with much more variety. Because you do not know on forehand what kind of questions you want to ask. You often are going through a whole set of refinement steps before you get to sort of the optimal algorithm of going through your data. But of course, this is of course a te te technologist's definition in the reality. Um, this is how most business people look at big data. Yeah? It is the collection and anal uh, an analysis of huge amounts of data to create a competitive advantage. And the important thing to realize there is that this is one of those cases where bigger is better. The more data you can collect, the finer grain result you can create. And there's lots of examples on them. Um, if, you go to, uh, if you go to your favorite search engine and you type in funny Amazon recommendations, you will find a whole things of hilarious things that we at Amazon do really badly. This, for example, is an example where we um, where you've just bought an oil filter, filter and we suggest that you buy an album of the Jackson 5. <laughs> or actually, we actually really uh, suggest that you should take uh, college entry exams because anyone that's able to put an oil filter in his car should go to college. <laughs> Probably, something like that. Or this one's even better. You've just put Japanese kitchen knives on your wish list and we suggest that you buy Windows 7. I'm not going to make any jokes about how the relationship between these two should work. Yeah? Um, it is obviously that something was wrong there. And the one thing that is wrong is uh, we did not have enough data to give you good recommendations. Yeah? We sh in, we, the real thing we should have done is not giving you a recommendation unless we just wanted to be really funny. But, um, so there's a whole range of these. And this is really cases where if we would have had more information, if we would have had collected more data over time, we would have been able to give you a much finer grain recommendation, something that would really match uh, the one purchase that you would have done. Now, I said earlier, you know, in the past, there was really, business intelligence was really well defined. You knew how much data you were going to co 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 collect. In the new world, you do not know how much data you're going to collect. You do not know how much compute you'll need, because often you'll do compute in a very iterative way. And so there's great uncertainty about the amount of resources that you actually need to, to do this in the future. You do not know on forehand how much data you're going to get. Uh, remember the gentleman this morning from Brandscreen uh, who explained that at this moment their click streams are already one petabyte and they're actually adding 10% on a monthly, on a daily basis, what was it? No, monthly basis probably. Uh, but if they sign up five more customers, that 10% is not 10%. The 10% will be 20%. And you know, so the more successful their business is, the more it will explode. And so it's really important for them to not have to worry about those kind of sites. So big data, because of all of this uncertainty about how much you need to store and how much compute you're going to use, requires no limits. It requires unlimited resources. And that's why I think, at least, big data and cloud are two concepts that are really tightly intertwined. Because in cloud, you can have this unlimited capacity, unlimited resources, unlimited storage. 
So let's look a bit, uh, let's take a look at this, uh, this pipeline that I talked about before. Yeah? This is really, if there is something that you should take away from this talk, then it is that big data, although it's being talked about in magazines and things like that, mostly about MapReduce and, and analytics, in reality, it is a pipeline. Yeah? It is how you collect the data. It's how you store it. It's how do you organize it, how do you analyze it, and how do you share it. And I'll go for each of these steps. So let's start with uh, collect. Now, it depends a bit where are the sources of your information. Yeah, if this is, for example, clickstream data of a website that you are already in the cloud, and it's obviously relatively easy where you can store that information. Often, our customers are just putting their log files in Amazon S3. But sometimes your sources are outside of the cloud. In this case, uh, the company is called Wakupa. They do data analytics for their customers. Uh, they do that by running um, agents on, uh, on customers' desktops. They collect all sorts of information about how they're using applications, how they're using websites, and things like that. And then they make use of, uh, of SQS, so of Amazon Simple Queuing Service. So periodically during the day, they will just upload data into SQS, and then they have workers sitting at the other side of SQS that import that and store it in S3, and do intermediary results, and then store that in RDS, and then later on they have their own visualization engine, and they create things that look like this, where they can get for their customers showing how, which newspapers are being read online, and things like that. So this is SQS is being used. Um, this is the oceanographic... Um, now, what's the, yeah, it's the Ocean uh, Observatories Initiative. This is, throughout the whole world, are sensors placed at the bottom of the ocean. And they're going to make, um, doing all sorts of, of research about movements of water and things like that. All that information is flowing back throughout the whole world into the uh, California Research Network. And then the California Research Network is through what's called network peering, connected directly to the Amazon cloud. So all of this data from all these sensors throughout all the world streams back immediately into Amazon S3. And then these uh, oceanographic researchers are using uh, EC2 to, to do analytics of their data. Uh, for quite a few of our, uh, our more enterprise customers who want to rely, not rely on the internet to make sure that they can have their data streams flow into these big data analytics. They use direct connect, so you can have one gig and 10 gig connections directly into the cloud and not rely on the internet. But sometimes your data sets are so large that even speed of light won't help you. Yeah, and then you should not underestimate the bandwidth of a FedEx box. Yeah? <laughs> What you do there is you just store your data on a set of USB disks, you put them in a box, you ship them to us, and on a daily basis, we have many, many, many of these boxes rolling in. There's a service called uh, AWS Import Export. You give us a manifest, you tell us what's on the disk, how you want to have it laid out um, in, in S3 or on an EBS disk, and we'll just put it there for you. So we get to, uh, now once your data is in the cloud, you still have to make a decision where to store it. And it depends a lot, of course, on what kind of data we're, we're, we're talking about. Storage turns out to be actually a pretty hard problem in the whole big data space. Um, Razorfish is a company of the Avenue A framework. They're sort of in the same space as that brand screen form of this morning also works. They basically do clickstream analysis for e-commerce companies uh, and help them target their customers better. And Razorfish was first doing this on-premise, and they were really becoming a storage company. Their best engineers were working on storage problems, not on analytics problems. And actually, they, even their salespeople were gated by the fact that they couldn't buy storage quickly enough. That they basically had to tell their sales guys, ho, 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 don't bring customers on that quickly, because we cannot grow our storage arrays that quickly. It is not the case for these kind of storage arrays. It's not like you take your car and you drive up to Costco and load it full of disks and you can get started. Plus, there's all sorts of problems that come with it. There is a great study by, um, what was it, two, three years ago in a conference called FAST. It's all about file systems. And there was a study in that, in that one conference, two studies actually, one by Google and one by Carnegie Mellon, both about the failure rates of disks. And it turns out that disks, irrespective of age, 
have a failure rate of around 8% on a yearly basis. Yeah, that means that if you just have five disks, you probably don't worry about that too much, but if you have 10,000 disks, suddenly 8% becomes a substantial number. Yeah, and if you have more than 10,000 disks, you know what? You'll have a team running around doing nothing else all day but replacing disks. And you have to start thinking about how to make this reliable, how to make this reliable at scale, because at scale, all these problems that you, and all these failures that will occur will happen to you. Yeah, at scale, all of these things is a nightmare. So there's a lot of storage muck. And, uh, and if it's not your own muck, then muck is coming from somewhere else. Yeah, this is, I uh, don't know if you guys know, but at the end of last year, there were some serious floods in, uh, in Thailand. Two Western digital factories completely ruined. And this mean meant that um, not only Western digital factories, there's actually a factory of a company that makes disk hard disk motors um, that actually supplies to many of the different ma manufacturers. So there was a significant shortage at the end of last year, and for, which some will say will actually run well into the second half of this year. And many customers have already seen if they were buying hard disk for on premise, substantial raises in hard disk prices next to shortage. Now, of course, we were fortunate because we've built supply chains, multiple supply chains, into each of our regions, and so we were not really affected by this shortage of hard disks. Um, and actually, even to the point that at the beginning of this year, while most disk manufacturers were rising, raising their prices, we actually dropped our storage prices. So this, if you are a big data company and you're reliant on the fact that you have, can buy, continue to buy hard disks, you are in serious trouble. And next to that, of course, then there's the database muck. Uh, it's, it's, I've talked about it this morning extensively. DynamoDB is, a, uh, is a quite a departure from how databases were managed before. Remember that big data is all about big. Yeah, that means that if you run this in a NoSQL cluster, we're not talking about five nodes in a NoSQL cluster. We're usually talking here about 30 or 60 nodes. Those are kind of the installations that quite a few of our customers are, uh, are, are running with. Um, there's a great use case on the, uh, on the AWS uh, uh, website from Foursquare uh, about their size of their installation just to support their data and, and analytics. So they're a company that heavily relies on a NoSQL database that they have to manage themselves because that was a choice that they made. We made it before DynamoDB was available. And um, uh, in discussions with the engineers at Foursquare, they really wish they would have a zero administration database that could just scale up and down without them having to think about it. Then we get to this magical piece in the middle of the pipeline called organize. So what can, what can be in there? What should be in there? It is actually that often these data streams by themselves are not that useful. They become useful if you actually combine them with other data streams. For example, if you have a click stream, uh, from your website, then of course you actually want to associate the information in that click stream with a real customer. That means you at least have to actually match up the click stream with your customer database. That's just a simple thing. But quite often you have two or three different click streams, or uh, you have, if you have multiple web properties that you want to com combine. Um, or, you know, you want to actually control the information that sits in that data stream that you're going to be analyzing. So data quality control is a very important piece of this organization step. Yeah? So control is one step. Control, for example, works if you have lots of user-generated content. Yeah? You want to make sure that only content arrives in that stream that is really totally relevant for what you are doing. Uh, for example, if it's about reviews, yeah, you want to make sure that reviews are indeed about that particular product, but also that the person that wrote the review actually bought the product. Yeah, that, that is something that is really relevant. It's not someone who writes a wrote from, oh, I just went out for lunch and I tried on these shoes and they fit really well. Those are often reviews that you will find back in these kind of streams. You have to filter them out. Yeah, so that's control. And then there's how to correct data. Uh, I don't know if you guys ever went through a merger or an acquisition where you ended up with two address databases. And if address databases would be really standardized, they would probably be able to merge really easily. 
But first of all, people make lots of mistakes in filling in data. And on the other hand, the one is in UTF-8 and the other is in Unicode. You, know, you try and merge those two databases. Yeah, and really making sure that then the outcome of that stream is a unique, uniquely identified stream is already pretty hard. Yeah, then you have to validate data. Are these actually articles about Amazon or, uh, or you know, how to go from unstructured to structured data? Now, for most of these things, we at Amazon are using a service called Mechanical Turk. Because it turns out that Mechanical Turk is a service where we have thousands of workers spread out around the world that actually um, behave as if they are computer programs. Yeah? It is on one side, you have a computer programming interface, you have a web services interface where you insert work in and it gets distributed over these workers and they do often, they duplicate the work and if the result of the outcome of both of them is uh, identical, then you get the result of that work back and you pay on a per result basis. Uh, so, for example, for controlling user-generated content is something that humans are much better at than computer programs. Yeah, there are so many cases where, as a human, we only need a fraction of a millisecond to look at two names and decide that they are indeed the same, although the one is spelled slightly different than the other one. Fuzzy matching is something humans do really well. And so we use Mechanical Turk for quite a few of these steps. So this is, for example, one of those cases. This is a large company in, in the U.S that uh, collects, what is it, about millions of uh, listings on a daily basis. Yeah, or li sort of data units, um, newspaper articles, uh, blog posts, things like that. And given the amount of content farms that are out there, it's actually pretty hard to figure out, is this an article that is really about Amazon, or is this actually someone who just tries to trick some advertisement just to make more, more, more money? And so this is one of the cases where you have to work really hard to make sure that data is validated. And that is actually the real right data that appears in the data streams that you're going to be analyzing. So then we get to the part of the pipeline that's called Analyze. And probably you've heard most about that. It's all about Hadoop and MapReduce and things like that. That's not necessarily the case. You know, there are many more analytics paradigms beyond MapReduce and Hadoop. MapReduce is actually a, a, a system that makes it really easy to, uh, to execute distributed programs, but it's not an analytics system by itself. Yeah, we'll, we'll get back to, to, to that in a minute. Um, actually, in the past year, I've seen about funding arrive for well over 100 companies that are all focusing on new style of data analytics on top of um, a cloud infrastructure, and often actually uh, on top of, an, uh, of a Hadoop infrastructure. All of these, and take for example Karmasphere, these are actually all companies that run on top of the AWS platform. What this means, actually, is that this whole world, this whole new world of data analytics, is still, um, still really day one. They really still have to start figuring out what are actually the right interfaces for business users to use such that they can iteratively ask questions about the data that you're collecting and that then that those questions get translated into you know, whatever executes underneath there and that does the data analytics. And there's a lot of work that still needs to happen there. And, and you know, actually, there is a lot of computational muck here as well. You know, we've had storage muck, we've had database muck, and there is also computational muck here. Because if you have to execute uh, a MapReduce program yourself, you have to do actually quite a bit of work. You have to set up master nodes, you have to make those master nodes fault tolerant, you have to start up, uh, you know, the first phase of, of the nodes, you have to second phase, some of those can be fault tolerant, others can not, you have to do all of that work. And that has nothing to do even with the analytics. And so we introduced something called Elastic MapReduce purely to help you focus on building, on making it much more easier to execute your Hadoop programs. So now the only thing you have to do is actually write your map, map phase and you have to write your reduce phase and you can just use EMR, as it's called, to execute your programs for you. And this is actually pretty popular because now you can really focus on writing those programs instead of all the work that you have to do to, to execute them. 
Um, the analysts have actually figured out uh, that that is, uh, is becoming an extremely popular uh, uh, approach. If you see all the way on the top, um, AWS EMR ranks as the absolute best MapReduce Hadoop environment to execute your, your programs. And there's quite a few of our customers that are doing this. Um, we talked earlier today about Netflix. Netflix has uh, enormous amounts of streams coming in, terabytes uh, per day uh, of information about how their customers are using their servers, and they are continuously analyzing uh, how customers are, are using it. Uh, Channel 4 in the UK is a similar approach. On one hand, they are analyzing how are customers watching television right now. But they are very interested in what's called second screen technology. So, which means that uh, they expect that in the future, most customers, while they are watching television, will have another device in their hands. And whether that is your cell phone, or whether it's your tablet, or something that is a mixture between that, but there will be something else that you're interacting with. Now, nobody knows how the user behavior is going to change. Yeah, so what they want to do, they do a lot of experiments here, but to actually figure out how does customer behavior change if we make changes in our applications, they do continuously data analysis. Yeah, this is a complete greenfield world. Nobody knows what is going to be the right way to actually engage customers on that second screen. Is that through e-commerce? Is it through um, you know, gaming? Is it through other things that are going on while you're watching that program? There's a lot of things to be done there, and analytics plays a very important role. Now, while these, these two organizations are big enterprises, you know, one, one observation that I've made, actually, is that while enterprises are starting to get, really getting the hang of how to do this large-scale data analytics, it turns out that young companies have already figured this out from the beginning. There is hardly a new business, a startup, that is starting today that does not make analytics core of their business. Most of them are using what's called a lean startup approach. That means that you get a product into your hands of your customers pretty quickly and then start iterating with them in a direction where they need to go. For that, analytics is key. And so let me, uh, let me give you an example of one of our customers. They're called SoundCloud. It's a, great, it's a great tool. SoundCloud was built as a platform where musicians could share music on mostly in the electronics domain, at least that's how it started off, and, and many customers could use that the platform to discover this music. They had data analytics programs from the beginning. On one hand, um, they helped customers with recommendations. If you like this, then you should maybe also be listening to that. Um, and remember, this is not data that you can get from the record labels, because this is not music, not made by musicians that are on record labels. So they would give information to uh, the musician saying, well, you know, customers that are coming to you also like these other things. And they would actually give an analytics product back to the record label saying, these are kind of the trends that we are seeing. Now, SoundCloud is what's called pivoted. But not pivoted as in going in a completely different direction. They actually pivoted to become larger. Yeah, so SoundCloud has now the ambition to become the world's platform for any audio. A bit like where YouTube does this for video, SoundCloud wants to be this for audio. And that means that you get all sorts of new uh, audio sources on this platform. And now they are using analytics to continuously watch the platform to see how new customers are using this. What are actually the new verticals arising on this? And very recently, um, they discovered, for example, that presidential candidates in the US are using their platform to store their speeches. Immediately, then, they take two business development guys and put them on that, business, on that new vertical to start building that out. But they require analytics to be able to figure out what is going on on that platform. And for example, uh, here in uh, Australia, freelancer.com continuously analyzes the kind of information that flows through their system. Yeah, I think they have about 40 million transactions on a daily basis that they're analyzing, and about um, they have lost streams that are about, is, I think, something between also 30 and 40 million items in their click streams about how their customers are using their website um, that they do uh, analytics on. 
And you know, it also goes here for, uh, for many of your popular web applications. All these businesses are all keyed around analytics. They may have a primary business somewhere else, but they could not exist if they do not, did not have analytics behind the covers. Actually, I wrote a great story this morning that seems that Etsy is opening up a store in Melbourne, so you'll actually have a, a local Etsy store here. Well, not close by, but, you know, in this country. <laughs> um, so all of these actually have built new products based on data analytics. And it's not just the web guys. Um, it's also, this is a great example. This is a company in Norway that built um, dictionaries for dyslexic people. Yeah, think about that for a moment. <laughs> yeah, not a trivial problem. Yeah, and so they have huge corpuses of text, um, <laughs> of funny text, let's put it like that. Yeah, and then going from the funny text to the right text is pretty hard. So they use, um, they use enormous amounts of compute power on a daily basis to build better libraries and to build better input systems. Great, great stuff uh, these guys are doing. But it's not only, uh, not only young businesses that actually do uh, interesting stuff. In this case, it's the federal government in the US. There's a site called recovery.gov um, that analyzes how the money that was uh, injected by the federal government um, into the country into for what was called recovery is actually being used. And, and it's a great site. Uh, you can go there, you can drill down, you can go into um, different, uh, different pieces of the country, you can drill down onto the county level, you can really see how money was being spent. And uh, this looks like a, uh, a, a very high-end, you know, dedicated, very specially built application. It turned out that that's not the case. Often you can build these things using off-the-shelf components. And in this case, the off-the-shelf components were traditional enterprise pieces of software. On one hand, it's ESRI that delivers the GIS information. It's SAP business objects, all running on top of Microsoft SharePoint. And of course, all running on top of the AWS cloud. Uh, but, you know, this actually, what I want to demonstrate with this, it's not always necessary to do a deep build of things. That you have to become an expert in running Hadoop programs before you can do this large-scale analytics. Standard off-the-shelf components are often, all, are often sufficient to help you get started there. Actually, SAP has a great other site. I don't know if you've ever seen this one. It's a service they deliver, on top of AWS, of course. Um, it's called uh, SAP Carbon Impact on, on, on Demand. I think there's tremendous interest around the world. I know definitely there's an interest here in Australia about how to measure carbon impact of a number of your core business operations. And so what SAP allows you to do is to stream information from your SAP installations to this on-demand service that they're running in the cloud, and then they will determine carbon impact for you. It's a very cool service. Visit the website. Maybe it's something that you guys would want to use. And it's in the analytics phase, it's not just a matter of, of really doing this Hadoop stuff. There's, there are enough examples out there, actually, that, uh, that work in the high-performance compute space here as well. They also have large data sets. Um, yeah, in terms of an, uh, of an Australian example, um, I have just been told that they are no longer called Cyclopic Energy, they're now Cyclopic Wind. Uh, it's a great company here out of, uh, out of Australia that uses models and data around wind farms to model new wind farms for you. So if you want to put on uh, a turbine on the top of your roof of your building, you're going to talk to these guys to model it such that how to exactly place that turbine on top of your building. And normally, their, their analytics would run for about a month to a month and a half. And actually, on AWS, because of the HPC capacity, they're able to complete each of those runs in a matter of a day or even less. They can actually sign up a ton more customers than what they would be able to do before. Uh, the MET service in, uh, in New Zealand also makes use of our HPC environment. Um, but other uh, companies in similar style, Weatherbug, for example, as well, makes use of uh, more of the Hadoop side of things to actually deliver real-time weather predictions to customers. 
And for that, you often need quite a substantial amount of, of uh, capacity when these changes are really happening. But in times of more stability, you do not need that kind of capacity. So being elastic is really important for these guys. And this is one of the, uh, the ones that uh, I'm always more proud of. Who wouldn't want to work for NASA? Uh, this is the NASA uh, Mars rover. All of the data coming out of the Mars rover streams directly into Amazon S3. And then they run all of their computation on, on, on top of that. So we now come to the last piece of this pipeline. Yeah, and share is definitely something that is also very much in flux. On one hand, you often have data results of these uh, computations where the data sets may even be larger than the input set. So one important piece here is often visualization. How do you visualize that data set, run that capabilities to generate those JPEGs in the cloud? Because if you want to do that on your desktop using Excel, um, your, your Excel may be busy for a while. Yeah? And so doing that in the cloud is a much better proposition. Actually, quite a few customers are running Excel in the cloud on a regular Windows instance just because they can get much more capabilities there than that they would ever be able to get on the, on the desktop and then just take uh, visualizations of that back as the data results. Sharing is also how to create a loop of them because many of these things are iterative. Yeah, or how to share that with other departments and have to take the data in and give you new data back. Lots of things happening in this share space where the cloud is an ideal environment for collaborating. Yeah, for example, uh, um, Eli Lilly is a large pharmaceutical in the US. They create, they instantiate whole environments in the cloud purely to do drug research at different hospitals, but they don't want to give them access to their own data centers. So what they do, they instantiate an environment in the cloud with uh, 64 HPC nodes and a bunch of collaboration servers around it such that the, these researchers can collaborate there in the cloud and then results from that flow back into the Eli Lilly data centers. And when the drug trial is over, they just pull the plug on that uh, whole environment and poof, it's gone. Uh, another great example in this uh, space is actually the, the data group of the NASDAQ. Uh, this is an app called Market Replay. And there's actually two sides to the story. One is not necessarily big data, but there's the origin of this application is that... Uh, uh, so the data group at the NASDAQ is responsible for archiving all the data that comes from the exchanges. And that's, that's a lot of data. Uh, so, but now and then they would get contacted by a customer who would ask them, can you go back to September 20th of last year and give me the puts and gets against Amazon at 1.32 in the afternoon? And I would fire up a massive ad hoc query against their great archival system, and then half an hour later, the answer comes back. They give the answer to the customer, and the customer says, hmm, that, that's great, but what I actually really meant was, yeah, and then they actually get in sort of this iterative approach. So the NASDAQ guys thought that, oh, wait, maybe there's a business to be had here. But then they looked at their backend, and their backend was an archival backend. That wasn't suitable for doing any interactive querying or anything like that. So as good enterprise architects, they made a big plan, and the big plan was many, many tens of millions of dollars, and it took three to four years to actually implement, as we normally do in those kind of situations. All for an application where nobody had a clue whether that was going to be successful or not. So they decided not to do that. And they took an approach that is almost so embarrassingly simple that it's, uh, that it's so, so simple that it's almost embarrassing. So what they did is they take the massive fee that's coming from the exchanges and dump all of that in Amazon S3 in simple text files for each ticker symbol for each 10 minutes. That means on a daily basis you create tens of thousands of files, but it's fine. Amazon S3 deals with that pretty well. They can just deal with that. And then they actually got a whole bunch of these flash components that they had laying around on the website anyway already, put it together in an air app, and then connect that one back to Amazon S3, fully metered, fully secure, things like that. And you can download this application actually from data.nasdaq.com, it's called Market Replay. Now, if this app would not have been successful, they would have been out of pocket $500 yeah, versus the X millions of dollars. Um, and versus maybe, I don't know how much they spent on actually developing the app, maybe there was a few $10,000 there as well, but their risk was minimal. Now, why does this fit really well into the big data story? Is that 
after a while, the guys at the NASDAQ started understanding that they are now collecting so much data about the historical uh, uh, markets that they actually have a great data source in S3. So at the end of last year, this group decided to put an API on top of that. So if you now actually want to start building applications using historical market data, you can just get that in the Amazon cloud. And there's actually quite a few, in this case, that will be a for pay environment, but there's quite a few public data sets available as well, whether there's census data, uh, lots of research data, uh, and things like that. Uh, and one data set that uh, I'm pretty proud of that we just uh, added is that of the Thousand Genomes Project. So I don't know if you guys have followed any of the, the sort of uh, uh, changes that have been happening in uh, genome processing. Um, there was a human, human Genome Project, I think that was about 10, 12 years ago, where it took us a number of years to just synthesize one genome. Yeah, and that actually resulted in sort of gigabytes of data, and, and the, the, the fun artifact anecdote around that is that they were actually transferring that information on iPods to actually shift, to ship it to each other. Um, then we got into the mode where we actually created many more of these. We were doing many more different species, rats, uh, dogs, things like that. Um, the result of that was actually terabytes. But the more interesting thing is actually to do it of a whole set of humans and actually start looking at all the different traits that these humans have and see if you have this data available for these thousands of humans, what kind of, what kind of research can we do on top of that? What kind of uh, insights can we create about diseases and things like that? So that started the Thousand Genome Project. We are talking here about terabytes of data. Yeah, and so all of this is available on Amazon through the public data set. There are 1,700 genomes at this moment. It's about 200 terabytes of data. That is something, if you put it on DVDs, that's about 30,000 DVDs. Um, and that's stored in Amazon S3. It's freely available for whoever wants to use it. And I think these kind of freely available uh, data will drive research in directions that we've not seen before. Now, sort of to close it off, these are sort of, there isn't a vertical that we're seeing that is not using big data in one way or, or another. Yeah, we've talked about retail, uh, transaction analytics there, uh, the advertisement things, uh, lots of fraud detection, antivirus stuff really needs significant computational uh, backends. There isn't an area where big data and data analytics will impact your business. So, and I'm putting this pipeline up as the last slide, because I really want you to understand that big data is much more than just that and a piece of analytics. While that's getting a lot of attention, if you are embarking on a big data project, you have to think about each of the steps of this pipeline. How am I going to get my data in the cloud? How am I going to store it? What are my storage options? How am I going to guarantee data quality? How am I going to match it up with other data sources as part of organization? Then you have to choose your analytics. Are you using System R? Are you going to use Hadoop? Are you going to use um, SAP business objects or any of these higher level tools? And then you have to think about how am I going to get the results to those who are actually interested in the results? Yeah, so the share piece is really important. So remember, collect, store, organize, share, um, analyze, and share. So take that with you, and um, it's beer time. Thank you.